Well, the fault of the stock of Queen Ursula, August Tar remade our Coloder Home More at Bagonia, August and Nolik at Jism Len. Kegel Covid nineteen a Bargatar and Agoni, Tasulag and Gmanish of Tanov as a layacht in you Lachsha, Nahuna Monahan. I've just been welcoming each one of you into this lecture, which is our second annual lecture of Krita Aaron Harp Ireland, and welcoming everybody here today who has joined us from many parts of the world. And we're doubly chuffed to see so many of you here, considering that Christmas is on top of us. And even more so, I was told by an avid GAA fan in my house today that how could we prioritize the harp over the clash of the ash in Croke Park when Waterford are playing Limerick? But suffice it to say that at the same time as Waterford and Limerick are playing and we're waiting to welcome Una Monaghan on, we are also welcoming you, you to um, the week when we received our UNESCO recognition, when we were inscribed on the Intangible Cultural Heritage List, acknowledging Irish harping as a key element of Ireland's living heritage for future generations. And that brings us very neatly to our visiting lecture Dr. Una Monahan, who's going to present today on New Horizons, Challenges in Contemporary Irish Harping. And Una has been forging ahead, creating a new identity for Irish Harping. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with her work, so I'm not going to dwell on her many achievements. Suffice it to say that she's a harper, composer, researcher, and sound artist from Belfast, who collaborates, improvises, and performs with poets, visual artists, computers, writers, musicians and others. She has an international reputation as in, in, and is in much demand all over the world for her experimentation with live electronic and multi-channel music. I actually had the privilege of hearing one of her most recent, work, recent works, Einaracht, which was a collaboration of the Arts Council and the National Concert Hall, where Una had been awarded the Liam O'Flynn inaugural um, residency in the Concert Hall, which was the first one. And it was fantastic to see harping there. But it was just a spellbinding evening where Una brought her work and her approach to work to light in such a, a magical way. I know you're going to enjoy the insights that she's offering us today. So Una will speak to us for about 40, 45 minutes. And then hopefully if technology obeys and behaves itself, we'll open it to the floor and you'll have a chance to um, input and maybe to ask Una questions. So I'm going to now hand over to Una Monaghan. Hi, um, everyone. Is my audio working and my video? You're fine. Yeah, absolutely. Super. Um, thanks so much for joining me here on Zoom. And uh, yeah, the All-Ireland Hurling final, final is actually going on downstairs. So I'm hoping the internet can cope with both. We might hear some yells from below. Um, yeah, thanks for being here and to Aileen and Harp Ireland for all of their work um, in general for Harping and Harpers and for inviting me to talk today. Um, I'll speak for 45 minutes and then we can take questions for 15 minutes after. Feel free to post them in the chat. If I think it's enabled as we go along um, and I can get to them at the end. So the talk's going to be in two parts. Um, the first about my background in Harping, um, my existing work on Harping Electronics and considerations I have when working on new pieces and designing interfaces for harp and electronics. Um, in the middle, I'll have a demo video of some of the interaction control I use when working with those systems. And the second section of the talk explores a few more general thoughts on my approach to harp playing today. And it's really a series of questions and um, things I'm still considering and things maybe we might all discuss or work with others to explore. So uh, a quick background, um, my first teacher was Janet Harbison and later on Grania Hambly. And they both had the greatest effect on me in terms of my learning as a harp player, um, early performance opportunities and technique. They are amazing people and harp players. Um, I encourage anyone who's not experienced their body of work to explore it at graniahambly.com and janetharbisonharp.com. In addition to them, um, Michael Rooney was someone I looked up to, had occasional lessons from at festivals and then learned a lot from him in terms of accompaniment and how someone can create and follow their own style as a harp player. So my first lesson was in 1992 as part of the bicentenary celebrations for the Belfast Harp Festival. This was a major undertaking, a festival of workshops, concerts, competitions and talks. 
And it enabled me to finally touch a harp for the first time, having asked about it for several years as a child. I was very lucky to win a Jan Mulliart harp there at the age of eight, gifted to the festival for a beginner. And I played that harp until I was 17. Um, I now play a Larry Eager nylon strung harp. My involvement in electroacoustic and experimental music began formally in 2005 when I started a master's in sonic arts at the Sonic Arts Research Centre in Belfast. I spent 10 years there in different roles, um, completing a PhD in new technologies and experimental practices in contemporary Irish traditional music in 2014. This was focused on a performer composer's perspective of combining Irish traditional music and live interaction with computer. So I was exploring ways to make new music across Irish traditional music, sound art and electronics. Since then, I've been active as a composer and researcher, um, making pieces in this way for harp and electronics, um, recorded on my 2018 album, Four, but also pieces for other traditional musicians and electronics in my uh, recent project, Interact that Aileen was just telling you about. And that project takes Irish traditional uh, instruments and makes a work for each of those and electronics with a particular performer in mind. So the first five in the series are separate pieces for harp, fiddle, voice, piano, and concertina, um, each of those with electronics. So they were finished in 2020, um, just at the start of this year, and presented in February at New Music Dublin, just before lockdown. And I hope to record those next year. I also work as a live sound engineer. Just a wee bit to say about um, my motivation with this work. Um, really what I'm trying to do is firstly, enjoy playing the harp in a way that interests me. So it's another sound world for me to combine harp with, to bounce off and to use to convey themes and feelings. I view electroacoustic work, uh, the work with harp and electronics as an expansion of the instrument, um, a way to send more types of sound and combine it with all that we love about the sound of the harp, its resonance, character and tonal quality, to add that to other sounds and manipulations that might be possible with all sorts of technology. The second thing I'm doing is I have an interest in sound itself, the reasons I'm, I'm working on this and in things that produce sound. So in microphones, in the potential for sound to surround the body, both as a player and as a listener, how technology can facilitate that beyond an instrument alone, um, maybe through surround sound systems. And I'm also looking for something to bounce off in performance in a way that's different to playing with another performer. And there's something there when I work with computer about control. It's about a relationship with the computer. Um, you don't have to consider its feelings. You can dictate or ignore or manipulate or change the relationship with the other sound maker or collaborator without thinking about their availability or their ego or their priorities or their feelings or their approach. And I'm not saying it replaces that from another performer or needs to replace that in working with other musicians, but it provides a different function, role or collaborator for me to work with computers. So when I perform, I work with the harp, I capture and manipulate the sound of the harp via computer. Um, I play other sounds out of the computer. These can be generated by the machine or they can be field recordings such as voices, machines, nature, ice cream vans, anything. Um, and there are examples of my work in that area online on the Vimeo channel and, and my website. And today I would ideally do a lecture demo. Um, so I would play or demonstrate the things that I'm talking about and it would make that a bit clearer. But with Zoom, that's a wee bit more tricky. So I'll talk about these things. It's probably a good idea to watch and listen to some of the recordings um, afterwards. And I'm really happy to take questions if the verbal description needs expanded upon. So my early training as a Irish traditional musician really shaped the first directions of my work for harp and electronics. In the beginning, I aimed to make music which referenced the tradition that I trained in and expressed myself from. Irish traditional dance music is often presented as several melodies, 
so one after the other in a set of tunes. And my first pieces for Harp and Electronics simply added sounds to dance pieces that I'd written with scope for improvised sections between the tunes in a set. So it was quite, it was sticking quite um, closely to the presentation of Irish traditional dance music as I'd learned to do. Um, the thing was that there's a real rhythmic element to that dance music, the reels and the jigs, and the combination of electronic sounds in rhythm with Irish traditional dance music, music either requires really excellent control of those sounds or the sounds have to be locked to a computer pulse that the musician must then follow. So there's a lot of work involved in really skillful use of loop stations or automated click track that we use a lot in recording. Um, I find that those tools constrained me in ways that I didn't quite like. They impinged on the freedom that I enjoy to improvise with silence, with rhythm and with melody. So I began to concentrate on developing pieces and systems which achieved a flexible rhythmic interaction with the electronics. So I was able to do things in rhythm with the music, but that rhythm wasn't fixed and it wasn't controlling me as a player. Um, so it was led by me rather than followed by me in live performances. My more recent pieces, while no longer restricted to the structure and rhythms of the dance music, continue to rely on the principles of interaction developed for that earlier work. And the development of the control of the computer that I worked through in working with the reels and jigs gave me a disciplined basis for interaction with the computer, which I could then depart from or build on or simplify. So, my pieces vary in the way in which I balance my focus between interaction with the electronics and reaction to them. And I find the interaction with the computer to be more satisfying when it exhibits the following characteristics. So the first for me is that it should work live and if possible, the sound should be created live. Um, the interaction should be able to engage with the rhythm of what the technology should aim for simplicity and setup and use and that came from you know a long history of playing acoustic instruments where you would just be able to go into a bar or maybe at a festival play in the street and your instrument was taken out of the case and it was played as soon as you introduce computers and technology it, the setup time really gets a lot longer and so even though it still is really long for me um i always have that idea in mind that maybe I'm trying to make an environment that I can start playing and start using quicker. And the other thing is the interaction should incorporate an ability to accommodate changes in how the piece is played between performances. So I'm really interested in not making pieces of music that are totally fixed. It's no coincidence that these findings have parallels in the ethos of Irish traditional music as I understand it. And it's possible that many of them arise from my expectations and preferences as an Irish traditional musician. For example, the requirement for indeterminacy in my pieces is reminiscent of how Irish traditional music can be made up of any combination of tunes in performance sets and the practice of including variation and ornamentation that's unique to the player and the performance. So I have some pictures and I'm hoping to be able to share those with you. So this is a picture of my performance setup. Um, The performances for harp and electronics involve an acoustic harp with microphones attached, one inside the resonant cavity of the harp and two attached to the soundboard with double-sided tape. And the microphones connect to an audio interface, which is attached to a computer. 
The sound output from the computer is sent to the sound system in the venue or my own local loudspeaker that you can see in the picture there um, for smaller performance contexts. And depending on the engineer available, I may send the computer output and the clean harp sound separately to be balanced at front of house, or I may send the harp and electronics already mixed from stage. My computer then runs software to produce or manipulate the sound. Um, for fixed media piece, pieces, that's pre-composed tape with live harp, this may be a digital audio workstation to play um, pre-composed audio. Whereas for harp and live electronics pieces, I use custom coded patches usually in Max MSP. So the live element of the computer output is dictated by the audio input or the method of synthesis and by the subsequent manipulation I choose to use in each piece. So the audio input can provide the basis of sound to be manipulated, but it can also act as a controller. So if the audio input that I'm given the computer is from the harp, that can either then be changed to produce the sound, or it, I can use the harp as a controller to decide what the computer does. So for example, a, mac a microphone can determine whether the harp is sounding or whether the harp is silent. And that switch can be used uh, to switch between sounds or behavior that, behaviors that I've defined in the code. Or I can use methods of pitch detection to dictate that some signs or behaviors should happen when a certain pitch or a pitch range is plucked. In addition to this sound-based control, I use separate hardware controllers. So the Nano Control by Korg that I have here offers buttons, knobs, and faders for easy access to settings, switches, or levels in the software. For control linked to heart plane, I use a wireless motion sensor um, that attaches via Wi-Fi to the computer. And this sends movement data, which is then calibrated and processed to recognize certain play and gestures um, that I use while playing harp. Um, despite years of playing the harp while seated, I tend to prefer to stand when performing with harp and electronics. I'm definitely less stable in this position. Um, and that in turn renders the instrument less stable. And this has implications for technical accuracy when I'm playing. However, if I'm seated, the relatively small size of the Irish harp and my height encourages a kind of a hunched and introverted image on stage, which doesn't fit with my priorities of engagement with the audience um, and the electronics. And I'm still thinking around this um, and about the balance between technique and how I want to engage with the audience. Raising the harp and positioning it on a wooden or perforated table, just like you can see in the picture here, it immediately opens up the sound. And so my body is further from the wider cavity at the bottom of the instrument. So the sound isn't absorbed so much by my legs or the floor. Um, I can hear more from the instrument when it's like that, both in terms of volume and also the character of the sound. So this expansion of the sound out also lends itself to a more e effective blending with electronics. My first patches for control of electronics while playing made use of the nano control that I was showing you earlier, this USB MIDI controller that enables me to alter the parameters of audio processing objects in the software, such as filters, delays, and modulators. I extended the USB cable to position the controller on the harp for easy access for a while um, that you can see in that photo. However, I became really frustrated at the disconnect between my playing and the control of the electronics. So pressing buttons, moving knobs and faders required a hand for a start, but it also required um, decision-making that was, for me, I felt it was detached from the heart playing and it, it was not a musical method of expression for me. 
So I felt using that device, it would never properly integrate with my plane to contribute effectively to the translation of the intent that I experienced when playing harp. So I decided to look for a method of control that was not actually separate from the harp plane. I turned my attention then to pitch tracking and immediately experienced difficulties that are related to the harp itself. Harps are multiphonic and extremely resonant and several notes are usually played at once. So the algorithm has difficulty choosing one if it's hearing several or differentiating between partials of the notes. And even if a single note is plucked on a harp, other strings resonate, which confuses the signal to the pitch tracker. Um, this could be investigated further by experimenting with microphone type and placement. But from a compositional point of view, I find pitch tracking really interesting in that these apparent shortcomings in how it worked introduced their own layer of randomness. So I've used pitch detection as a method of sound control in several pieces where I don't require accuracy. For example, in almost a Hamish, um, differently filtered noise is sounded depending on the pitches played on the harp. However, pitch detection remains an inaccurate method of control for me and certainly could not be relied upon to follow rhythm consistently. So on to the first steps in gestural control. I was initially skeptical, skeptical about using movement sensors to control sound from the computer. Um, body movements have been for me a secondary consideration just a necessary action to produce music from the harp. And similar to my experience with the nano control, I expected that data based on the music played, the actual notes played through analysis of the audio, rather than movements made, would be the most meaningful way of controlling sound from a computer. But as a compromise, I chose to focus on gestures we normally produce when playing traditional harp. Um, Few traditional musicians, myself included, I would say, um, were not really trained in movement-based performance. And the body language of traditional musicians in performance is often very introverted. And any gestures translating expression will be those related to a musical purpose. So at first, the decision to restrict and already made while I was in the harp. That was influenced by a preconceived idea of maintaining normal playing appearance. So I didn't want to be making gestures that weren't necessary for playing harp. Um, but also it was appropriate in the context of the fast dance music that I was trying to work with, because there's little room for auxiliary gestures anyway when you're playing at, at speed. The main playing gestures on the harp are related to plucking motions um, and are localized to the fingers. So the sensors I've been working with are very sensitive, they're reliable, they're small, but they've all so far been too big to position on the finger and tracking fingers would result in really a lot of data. Um, so I looked for other places to put the sensors and in placing so much importance on playing gestures, I almost disregarded as insignificant the movement or lack of movement between notes. So instead of focusing on capturing plucks, I started to focus on the space between the plucks. And I realized that a gesture made consistently before or after playing can be just as useful as the action of playing. So similar to the relationship of a photograph with its negative, the length of time I choose to leave between left hand chords is as valuable to capture as the action of playing those chords. So the absence of chords is a musical decision and an indication of expression as much as the existence of those chords. And as it happened, these intermediate points between the chords have provided the instances of control that I've used many times to tell the computer what to do. So I now use a motion sensor on my hand, this little box, it normally sits here um, and is secured with elastic really. Um, the motion sensor sends continuous accelerometer data to the computer 
which then um, I process that data in Max MSP. And data from an accelerometer records changes in speed um, rather than the actual speed or position relative to the harp. So accelerometers are good at um, they're good at measuring sharp movements. They're most likely to be discernible because they represent a, a range of speeds over the course of their execution. In Irish harp playing, the fingers of the right hand commonly play the melody, while the left hand provides a rhythmic accompaniment. To capture rhythm from the movement of the right hand, we'd require monitoring of these finger movements because the hand itself moves continuously and comparatively smoothly up and down the soundboard of the harp. The movement of the whole right hand doesn't follow really the rhythm of the music necessarily, the actual movement of the whole hand. The left hand, however, often changes direction to move up or down the harp after each chord. And I therefore wear the sensor strapped to the left hand and I'm able to register most of these sharp movements at the end of chords while playing as I would naturally. So stopping the computer sound is a challenge when working with live electronics. Computer sound can be triggered or created with controllers, but it's usually really difficult to effectively stop it happening. Um, this is because it's easier to define when gestures or sounds are happening than it is to define when they are not or they've stopped. So with acoustic harp, I often use one of the contact microphones as a gate. So the computer is only allowed to sound when the harp is playing. That microphone knows when the harp's making noise and it only allows the computer to make noise at the same time. The damping of strings then um, provides a sufficient variation in dynamics for that microphone to be reliable. And the ability to silence the computer using the harp in that way with one gesture um, it strengthens my perception of the heart plan as having been expanded to fully control the electronic sounds because I can silence the harp and in doing that I can also silence the computer. In performance as well, um, the action of damping those strings combined with the corresponding disappearance of the electronic sound can be quite dramatic. It's effective visually for the audience and I find it quite enjoyable as a player. Um, such a gesture can enhance the understanding of the relationship between player and electronics. And that has been shown to increase audience enjoyment of a performance when the audience can understand how the electronics are being controlled and what's going on really. And where the electronics are controlled via motion sensor, I'm really aware of keeping my left hand still when I want silence. And that's especially important as pieces end, because if I move my hand and that creates sound from the computer, if I've finished a piece, I have to keep that hand still until I've told the computer that the piece is over. So I'm going to try a demo now of one of the pieces that I, I use, uh, I work on with Harp and Electronics. It's called Neowog, and I've got a video of what I see on screen when I'm playing this piece. And there's no sound to the video, so I'll let it play. It shows a demo of the, the screen and I'll try and explain over the top of it what's happening. So this is just going to go through the parts of the screen. This is what I see. In, uh, I have to, so I have to turn on audio to allow the computer to sound. I then turn on the sensor to make sure it's reading. Um, audio comes in from a microphone on the harp and I can process that audio and record it. Um, this is the silent microphone I was talking about, which senses when the harp is being played or when it is silent. Um, up here is the dampen motion. So that's a gestural thing that the motion sensor can recognize um, when I've damped the strings. This part monitors when the left hand is still. Here you'll be able to see the incoming sensor data from gyroscope, accelerometer, and magnetometer. This is a buffer that records sound from the harp that I can then use to process. 
And this is a matrix which routes the signals um, depending on which section of the piece I'm in. And I can tell what section of the piece I'm in here because different sections of the piece will have different behavior coded. So I use a wireless motion sensor um, on the back of my left hand. That's, I usually have a black cover on it and it's a slightly older version of it in that video. So here I turn the sensor on. You can see the um, motion, the, the data coming in from the movements. And this also tells when it's still. So here's the stationary hand. This will rise when it's stationary and move down every time I move the hand. So the computer can tell when that hand is still. This is continuous movement now from the hand. And now um, you can see here when it recognizes when I'm making a damp in motion. So here's the damp in motion with the hand and this will flash every time. So I can pretty reliably tell the computer when I've damped that motion and that can trigger a sound every time I damp the strings, which isn't happening on a pluck, but it is happening on a damp. This just shows a bit of the silent mic. I'm just conscious of time. I'll skip that on a wee bit. Um, there may not be audio, but well, there is audio. So when the harp's being played, it's off, and when I damp, it's silent. So during the first part of this piece, I play and record into the buffer. So here's the direct sound coming from the harp, and that goes into this buffer, which is then populated with an audio file that I've just played from the harp. And I can then choose via my dampen motions what part of the audio file the computer is going to play. And that provides an accompaniment then to the piece that I'm playing from the computer in addition to the harp sound. So this is what it looks like towards the end of the piece when there are several different effects going at once. And the harp damp, as I damp the strings, chooses positions in this audio file to play snippets of. Okay, so hopefully that shows a bit of what I see when I'm playing and I'm happy to take questions on that at the end as well. So I'm gonna talk a wee bit about um, compositional considerations and improvisation with harp. I've used a range of processes and programs um, depending on what it is I require for each of the piece pieces that I'm writing. So I often want to generate the computer sound live and I often want to generate it from the harp itself. I'm really interested in the importance of live performance as a period of creation itself. So when performing to the audience that the music is being created in some way there with them. Additionally, the use of the harp sound as a basis for audio processing. So using the harp as the fodder really for the electronic sound reduces and results in sonic material that's timbrely related. So if I make the electronics out of the harp sound, then it's going to be matched in some way to the harp that I'm playing, but isn't predetermined. But if you loop or live sample from the harp, it's really complicated by the resonance of the instrument. So if you make a change or a loop or make a little recording before the sound dies away or is damped from the harp, if you're making these recordings in real time, clicks can be created in the sound from the computer because the harp takes so long, the sound to die out. This continues to be a problem, even if the plucked strings are damped because there's likely to be audible sound from the resonance of the other strings on the instrument, depending on the microphone source and the level. I often capture sound from the harp in a buffer, like we saw in that software demonstration, 
And then I try to find interesting ways of reproducing and processing it in Max MSP, incorporating fades to try and reduce those clicks from the resonance of the instrument. I've used the sensor data to switch different players on and off or to move the playhead according to hand movements. In addition to working with harp and live electronics, I collaborate as an improviser with other musicians, writers and visual artists. I add improvised harp performance to my own fixed media compositions, so things that are pre-composed. Examples include Relta and Njaku. And the decay of the lower strings the resonance of the harp provides scope for merging fixed media pieces with live harp sound. I notice an influence on my harp playing when I'm playing in response to live electronics. This is obvious to me, even when the mechanism of interaction is relatively straightforward, and even when playing music that follows the form and rhythm of traditional dance tunes. For example, if I'm triggering source recordings, I might begin to adjust the left hand accompaniment to play in a higher pitch range so as I don't interrupt the sound file playing. So if a sound file is triggered by a lower accompaniment note and I want that sound file to continue, I'll change my accompaniment to play higher up the harp so as it doesn't interrupt that sound file. And that is the electronics then having an effect on the choices I make and the music that I'm making as a harper. Sometimes I stop playing a left hand accompaniment altogether, depending on what the electronics are doing. I find that experience to be similar to that when performing with another musician. Um, performing with computer can be a really meaningful experience for me. Um, it can result in greater focus inward on my own emotions. I often feel a connection with the computer as I do with other musicians. And I believe this is facilitated by the interaction being understandable to me, being balanced between control and causation. And that interaction is such that I can continue to play and express myself musically in the technique I'm most versed in, playing harp, if I wish to, while the electronics are happening. In working with the electronics, harp specific tools such as the Kamak MIDI harp and the interpretation of movement data specific to harp gestures are paramount. I've always been aware of stereotypical views of the harp as well and of the expectation that it produces a beautiful and relaxing sound. Um, sometimes I've sought to write pieces or use electronic processing that deliberately challenges this. So examples include the noise section in the choice and later in the same piece, the manipulation of the harp sound to distort and bend the harp's pitches as they ring out. As with any instrument, finding methods of live electronics control while playing harp is pretty challenging. With an acoustic harp, pitch tracking is really difficult because the instrument is so resonant. Uh, gestural control is difficult because of the relative lack of movement of the body when playing. Um, and those movements that we do make aren't necessarily related to expression or meaning in performance. The harp size, shape and visibility from stage really increases the potential for an audience to see and understand the relationship between player and electronics. So if you have an audience looking at the harp being played, Relative pitches can be understood based on the hand location. If you're at the top of the harp, it's high. If you're at the bottom, it's low. People can see that from an audience. And playing gestures, including the silencing of the harp by damping all of the sound and strings, those are really identifiable actions. So it does lend itself um, to working with electronics. Preconceptions about the harp and its recognizable sound that I was talking about before, it can really provide a palette to work in opposition to. Um, and with some effort, the harp can be an exciting instrument to combine with live electronics for both performer and listener. So just to finish and maybe to feed into the discussion, if anyone's interested, um, I'd like to add four questions that occupy me on an ongoing basis just around the harp, more, more general questions. The first one is about um, instrument access and diversity. 
let's see if I can share my screen again here. So I gained access to this instrument. This is me and Jan Mulyart in 1992. I gained access to this instrument through a hair scheme and a donated instrument. It's really important we ensure there's good access to what is a large, less freely available and expensive instrument. And I know there are some areas of the country that have excellent harp schools and access to beginner harps. And schemes like Music Network, Cardin Akritia and others promote opportunities to hire harps. They're brilliant. It's really important these schemes and learning opportunities continue to be supported so that our harping community better reflects the diversity of the population and that we're aware of socioeconomic and other barriers to harp playing. Also, the language around any instrument can really have an effect on its uptake and can affect how a child views a particular instrument. It seems that more women than men play harps. Um, and while we have brilliant, prominent male role models, we should actively ensure that boys consider this to be an option. Providing access to harps can also be combined with supporting our harp makers. Um, it would be really great to have more awareness and structures in place for harp maintenance and upkeep as well. I'm speaking from a personal point of view there. Um, harp upkeep and maintenance, it's a difficult thing to do when instruments are handmade, but if a maker is no longer available to perform the maintenance on their own instruments, it'd be really great to have a directory for this um, and for the purchase of harp accessories in Ireland. The second thing I'm thinking about is um, nationalism and symbolism. And I've been aware of some of the discussions on the harp as a symbol, as a national emblem, as a government logo. Some of these discussions brilliantly organized by Harp Ireland and the Ackle Harp Festival as well, I remember a few years ago. And it's a really interesting topic in terms of the image of the harp, um, how it's used politically and culturally versus the reality of life as a harper and how or if those things interact. Like ideas of Irishness, it's really important to keep an awareness that Irish harping is not a fixed concept, that it incorporates a broad range of players and styles, and that it has a really long history and a history of change. Um, harping should be open to change in a way that Ireland and traditional music more generally needs to be. And I think this perspective is born out of two formative early experiences for me. Um, the first was the really rich experience at the bicentenary of the Belfast Harp Festival in 1992 that I was speaking about. Um, this was my first encounter with harp playing, my first lesson and a brilliant introduction to what has become a constant interest companion pastime and work. Um, that festival featured harp players from across the world. I particularly remember Alfredo Orlando Ortiz, Sheilas, uh, Mary McMaster and Patsy Seddon, Robin Hugh Bowen and others. And it gave me a sense from the very start that harp playing encompassed many types of music and sound. As an older teen, I realized that I no longer played an instrument that commonly featured in orchestras. And I wanted to find a way that would enable me to play orchestral harp music. So I sought out um, a summer school on classical harp playing. And I arrived there and all of the other players had already been learning harp in classical music traditions, reading music while playing with a different technique and with methodical processes for relaxing the hand between plucks. Unfortunately, the attitude towards my existing training and expertise was not very positive. And the experience overall was tinged with negativity and I didn't pursue studies in classical harp. That's really a matter of some regret to me and I hope that that was a one-off experience and I see so much greater collaboration, respect and coherence among the harping community in Ireland today. And I hope young harpers learning whatever their introduction to harp playing, their, whatever their initial style, technique or type of music, that they have an appreciation of the wealth of styles and genres in harp playing, that harp events that we organize reflect this. 
and that this diversity is not pitted against one another ever or, or made into a discussion of one taking precedence or being respected over the other. The third thing I'm thinking of is improvisation and how that might be related to technique and placing. My technique, placing and hand shape and priorities were very much shaped by early training in Irish traditional dance music. We are indebted to players in the second half of the 20th century for the work done to resituate the harp as a melody player on which fast paced traditional dance music was possible um, with its own considerations of ornamentation, accompaniment, rhythm, fingering and arrangement. But recently, and not so recently, I've had to acknowledge and consider the effect of this background when working in experimental and improvised music, especially. Particular notes on the harp are not linked to particular fingers. So the placement chosen depends on where your hand has just been in the melody and where it intends to go. That's how you decide the fingering. And I was taught to spend time planning out the fingering of a piece with attention to the strong beats falling on stronger fingers and sensible grouping and switching of positions depending on the melody. If you then move to improvised music where the fingering can't be mapped out in advance on this instrument, this has implications for the music that you actually improvise and the notes that come out. And I think this has implications for variation within Irish traditional dance music. I haven't studied this in a structured way, but I have a feeling that the habit of planning out fingering in that way would have an effect on the options for variation that's open to us as harp players in traditional dance music in a different way than they would be to say a flute player who can usually predict exactly where their hand will be. So there's no fear of a flute player's hands ending up very far from where they need to be after a spontaneous variation because their hands don't move position. And I wonder, does this mean that as a harp player, I feel more of a need to plan out my variations to allow for finger implants and sensible hand location? And how does that affect harp players' music, creativity and our ability to improvise? Are there hand shapes associated with traditional harp music? And how does this shape what we then create? And the last question is just about the size and shape of our instrument. Um, harps are comparatively big instruments. And I think it's really important to continually consider norms of performance and in playing and to wonder about best practice. I was speaking earlier about decisions to stand while playing. And I do think this compromises the stability of the harp and my hands in relation to it. Although there's a balance to be achieved with stage presence and access to computers and controllers while I'm playing. I learned to play with legs either side of the harp for stability and to ensure steadiness of the harp. And this position means the player approaches the harp with less of a twist to the body shape. In the past few years, I've noticed women players sitting with both legs to one side of the harp. And while this is of course everyone's own choice, I really hope that decision is not constrained by clothing or gender norms relating to body position. It's really important that we promote playing positions that provide stability and don't result in an unnecessary body twist. And any compromising of harp technique or potential for injury should not be gendered. Um, Heart players are susceptible to injury, and it's important that we're aware of this from an early age um, regarding the effect of shoulder tension, carrying harps, twisting while playing, as well as tendon, arm and back pain. For example, I would love there to be a better design of trolley. It's still just easier to carry the harp than to put it on those wheelie things um, with accompanying physical consequences over time. Um, traditional music in particular, does, it doesn't have such a long history of attention to the physical toll of playing an instrument. And I'm really happy to see all of the work by Liz Doherty and others to raise awareness of this to ensure that musicians continue to play without pain for longer. And I really welcome any resources aimed at heart players around physical health. 
So um, I'll finish there. Um, these these are some of the people who have supported my work that I'm really grateful to. Um, thanks for taking the time to join us today and I'd love to take any questions or hear some of the discussion. Many thanks, Una. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. And I'm going to ask um, if people would like to, to input, if they can raise their hands and unmute themselves before they do. But that was an absolutely wonderful insight, Una, into your own thinking and your practice. And you've raised so many questions for me in terms of those four questions that um, you finished up with let alone there, there is food there for thought for us all for single lectures on each one of those items, apart from what you shared at the beginning. I have to say that I'm gobsmacked by the technology and all of that technology um, is going apace with how you interpret the tunes and the actual music itself. So um, I'm going to open it to the floor and um, if I can just manage to make this technology work. Yeah, I'm bringing people back in on gallery. That's great. Um, now, would anybody like to ask a question? Eileen, I just see that the chat is disabled. Sometimes it's easier to put things in the chat. Yeah. And so maybe people can put it, any questions there. And, you know, I know what it's like in these things, asking questions. It's kind of terrifying. There's 25 wee blank pages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, feel free to chat and feel free to post a written question. I'm really happy to talk. That's great. So the chat is enabled now? So it's over to people now to, to input themselves. I see people coming in here. Would anybody like to kick off? Would anybody like to start? Very colloquial expression to use in a day like today. Yeah, what's the score? <laughs> in the hurling. <laughs> <laughs> Limerick, got it. Limerick won, oh my God. Great, great celebrations there. Yeah, no questions. Um, okay, I, I can say something. Yeah. Um, Kathy, yeah, come <laughs> in, Kathy. Um, so you're obviously able to program and you know I'm I'm not a Mac user at all because I'm I'm not in the art in the arts as such with for, for my computing. Like, is there anything that you find that can't be done on a Mac that you would prefer not to be on a Mac for? Is or is Mac always the way forward? Do you know, just thanks, Cathy, and lovely to see you. Um, yeah, hello. <laughs> just to just to clarify that when I say Max MSP, it's a software environment. Oh, no, 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 I know that. I know that the Mac, I've, I've been looking at Max MSP um, on. I, I'm that. pretty sure it runs on other computers. Yeah, I suppose just whenever you're writing algorithms and stuff, like are all the That's programming all languages. Max. Okay. I mean, I, I can do some other things, but I found Max to be, it, I think it's, Pretty much everything that was on my album was either pre-composed tape or or Max, um, yeah. and so it it's kind of a steep learning curve for that software. And like any creation pro process, deadlines are amazing. Like a yeah. lot of the reasons that I learned how to do this stuff was by having a deadline for a piece or having a deadline for something, and then having to make it in that space of time. Um, it's, it's like learning a language as well. If you have to immerse yourself in it for a, a, a long period of time or an intense period of time, you get further quicker. Um, in saying that, that, I just tried to lay out some of the reasons why I've gone down that changeable software route. There's loads of commercially available pieces of hardware like the loop stations, like the um, pedals and things that if you're interested in it, definitely might work. I was just trying to describe some of the ways in which the harp is actually really hard in that respect because it doesn't oh, yeah, stop, it doesn't stop yeah. making noise until you actually cover it in a quilt. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, but also happy to talk about that as well. 
And yeah, no, it, I, was, I was just looking it up and it was just, yeah, because anything that it was mentioning, I would probably be easy, you know, happier doing on, on a Windows base. But. I think it does work though. On, I think it's also available on Windows. Yeah. Can I bring Esna in here, Esna Benson? Esna, you're welcome. Sure, hello. Thanks, Cathy. You, John Mike, can you hear me? You can. We can, yeah, we can. Yeah. Um, well, I would have a kind of a lighthearted question because I'm getting bogged down in all the technical stuff, which is fantastic and fascinating. But my uh, my question would be that they all of your work around has been around the harp uh, and the computer. I suppose you see that as another instrument, which I understand. Um, I wonder, with all the difficulties that you've outlined in using the harp in this context, did you ever want to play anything else? or to be involved with developing this work alongside a, a different instrument, which wouldn't have uh, given you the challenges that you've got from harp playing. Well, you see, it's maybe my fault for listing all of the challenges. Mm -hmm. I figured I was talking to a harp audience, you know, but um, what I didn't say, which you've really brought up, is that the reason I'm doing this through the harp is that I've had 20 years playing it before I started with the tech. And if I was interested in making music from computers, to me, I had to build on my existing skill. And so I was only gonna go further back if I disregarded all of the effort I'd already put into playing harp. So harp remains the, the, the way in which I can express myself musically at all, really. Um, and so, I had to build the technology on top of that. It seemed daft to me to disregard so much effort and practice and years of playing and also the love of the instrument. The technology sits on top of that for me. And my my first expression musically, compositionally, emotionally to an audience is through the harp. And that's why all my tech work is focused on how can I base this? How can I move through the harp with this stuff? Um, there's a lot of tech that involves sitting on a stage, pushing things like this, playing computers, playing stuff out of computers. But it's really important to me to do it through the harp because it's my first method of conversation with an audience. In terms of other instruments, I've over the last two years started to do this work with other traditional musicians. And that was what the Ian Rock project was about. Um, it's great, it provides you with a different sound palette. It provides you with different gestures for control. The piano was a really beautiful experience there because I could use some of the same sound capture techniques. Um, you know, it had all of those resonant strings as well. Um, and that project was so enjoyable. I'm hoping to record it next year. Um, the issue there though, is that I can't tell you how much time this takes to try something out, to, to try and get a gesture, to see if it is reliable. You know, I might make a lovely sound and it never comes back out of the technology again. I have to have something that's going to produce reliably every time I walk on a stage. Because an audience, your tech and your computer and your instruments can be so interesting, but see if an audience has showed up to listen to you and they just see you banging at a computer in frustration if something doesn't work. So it takes many, many days and months of fixing reliability in this stuff. And whenever you then start to work with another instrumentalist, that's on their time, like it's on their clock and you're paying them for those rehearsals. And I just, it takes a lot of funding for me to work with another person because I don't want to be asking them to do that for free, you know? Um, so I think the most amount of work I make is still for myself because I don't mind working till two o'clock on a Sunday. <laughs> on the stuff. Listen, can, I ask, can I ask everybody to come in on video so we can see you? Some people are coming in. Only if you want to. People in. So you can come in on so we can see you, actually welcome you in here. Um, and I just see as, um, that Anne-Maria Farrell has put in chat here to congratulate her on a wonderful talk and demonstration. And she's delighted to see the furthering of new musical dialects on the harp. Also wonderful to hear her advocacy for enabling greater diversity in harp playing both musical and societal. So thanks for that, Anne-Marie. You're welcome in, Adrian. And hey, before I, sorry, Amy, before, I, Amy, before I go, my little, yeah. just would like to say to Una that I wasn't for one minute suggesting that she change 
from harp to another instrument. That wasn't <laughs> what I had in mind at all, because your passion for the harp is coming through really, really strongly. And the work that you've done in ground is groundbreaking and has really opened doors that were closed fairly tightly in the past. The whole idea of the, uh, the focus on harp and the image of the harp being about a lovely, gentle instrument. I think you've done a lot of good work on that. Actually, that's fantastic. I love what you've done. Thanks, Edna. And I think it's better for everyone if I stick to the harp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anne-Marie, did I see you wanting to come in there with a comment or a question? You're on mute. Yeah, no, just it was, um, th thanks a million, Una. It was absolutely marvellous. Um, I. There was just something you said there a minute ago, which I really related to, but not in relation to technology, but just um, one of my pieces has subharmonics on the harp and they're so unreliable that I'm really frustrated with the production of them. And I love the idea um, of subharmonics, but they only come out a small proportion of the time. And I was only thinking kind of last night about the, that, the, the publication of sheet music of a piece with an idea in it you know, so uh, anyway i just i relate to this completely different context because it's not really a technology but no. if we don't explore uh we won't get anywhere so fair, yeah. fair play to you yeah. i don't even think i think it is related and i think it's really important and the way i deal with those sorts of questions is that I factor into pieces that kind of indeterminacy and I think well my intent is there to produce this some gigs it'll appear and some it won't and see to be honest see the gigs that appears you go like this and it adds you've got that in your performance then the audience notice they might not understand why you've suddenly been delighted with yourself but I think like continue to put those in um and and also just the notation question you know not all of this work is notated. In fact, so little of it is. Um, the indeterminacy of it is really a part of it for me. Um, and in a way, I just try to settle myself in that regard by saying, it doesn't matter if it doesn't come every time. There's This is the thing about fixed pieces of music, because I, I've played them for, for years and very related to performance anxiety with me as well, that if you have a piece of music that is supposed to be fixed, well, then you can screw it up. And, you know, I love to perform pieces that I can't screw up because by their nature, they're not, and I don't have that pressure. And then I think it makes an environment that is enjoyable for me, which I almost left performance, you know, because you're on stage and if something's not, per there are many performances that aren't enjoyable because the stress is so high. And so, I like pieces that have indeterminacy built, built in. in that. I can see Una's, Una's uh, your internet is just a little bit unreliable there at the moment, Una. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can. You're on mute there again. All right. You know, what I was fascinated with was when Una was talking about your, your really keen interest to establish that connectivity with the audience, Una. And then at the same time, this parallel connectivity that you have with your computer and the interaction of that. How do you manage to um, cope with those competing priorities for yourself and maintain that connectivity with the audience, which is so important for a musician? I don't really know. I mean, I manage it to different extents on different nights. Um, I try to write pieces that are going to inherently have some connection with the audience, even though I might not know what that is. And one of them I'm thinking of is the Chinwag, which is a piece based on a conversation, women's voices, um, an older generation than me. And you know, everyone knows a, a person of that generation and identifies with that style of speech. And once those voices come out, it was only through feedback from audience and different concert, concerts that they said, you know, I got from that piece this, or that piece reminded me of this person that I knew. And if you introduce elements like that, which in a way will strike some sort of chord with, with everyone in some way, then I engage with the computer in a way that's responsive for me. And I'm confident that the field recordings and the electronic sound will in some way reach the audience. And then I try to reach the audience in the pieces between the tunes where I, I speak. Um, but yeah, I think the audience are also reached when they see you 
having a meaningful experience with electronics live. That's what I'm hoping anyway. <laughs> and certainly if anybody gets, if we're lucky enough for Einarust in itself to be performed again, Una, I would strongly advise everybody here to try and get to it because that was one um, experience. In fact, it was an experience where you managed to meld the instrumentalist with the visual art, with the whole dynamic around the place and lighting, sound. It was, it was an absolutely wonderful experience, like I was saying at the outset. So would anybody else like to come in? I'm conscious of time now, and Una's, Una has given a lot of herself. Imogen, take yourself off mute there, Imogen. Yeah. I think you're still on mute there. Bottom left, Imogen, or put it in chat. Put it in chat. Oh, she's no... Hi, Imogen. <laughs> yeah. Put it in chat, Imogen, if you like. While we're waiting for Imogen, anybody else like to come in? It's really nice to see everyone. <laughs> yeah. I think that the the um, the point, Una, that you made about um, access and diversity, and particularly access to harps, is really important for all of us and for many. Yeah, but and I think brilliant work is being done. I mm. think there are certain places in the country where there's a really rich access mm. to higher schemes. I mean, I'm saying this right now because I know of a beginner in England actually where I'm trying to source a harp for that person mm. and. I just know, I mean, I know what my own story is and I know what my access to harp was and I know how many points along the way where I just might not have had that access. And so it's it's so important to me to, to do what we can and to continue to support these brilliant schemes that you yourself and, and others are running. Mm -hmm. I know we yeah. have the gang down there in Wexford as well. Mm -hmm. And I think I think one of our aims, Harp Ireland, Quid's Aaron Harp Ireland's aims is to promote Irish harp making and to make sure that we can get as many out. I think Music Generation is doing remarkable work there as well. Yeah, and a lot can be done with, you know, smaller harps in the in interim, you know, mm -hmm. as a first contact at a small harp. We know this, you know, with even half bladed or. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the getting more boys to play. We have, we have been working very hard on that. And I think, again, you're competing with the hurling and the football. Um, as yeah. The, and I know my own, you know, I know, I know loads of ones that p had to pick between sport and, and music. And, you know, if they don't want to play grand, but I just want to make sure that there aren't barriers that don't need to be there. Okay. Uh, Kathleen, do I see you wanting to come in? I see Kathleen's hand up. Kathleen, come in. Okay, let's unmute Kathleen. You there, Kathleen? Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Come on in. Yeah. Um, Una, many thanks. It was absolutely fascinating. But I'm just wondering, I mean, I, you know, I would be terrified because I'm almost terrified as a computer. But um, I'm just wondering, you know, around the world, it, it, it sounded to me like a lonely enough sort of world, this world of extraordinary, complex uh, And, and then the, the very personal, emotional uh, instrument that we all play. And I just wonder what sort of company have you from around the world in terms of working in, with the, you know, in such a very sophisticated way and in such a very well-informed way about sound. So uh, can you see um, your particular way of working as um, becoming you know, uh, possible for, for many? Yeah, um, it's a great question and it's one I think about a lot because I think, of course, your own musical um, journey really shapes what you end up doing. And I know many people who got involved with groups and bands very early on. And for whatever reason, I was never in a band. And I I just, a lot of my playing has been on its own. And maybe okay. to do with the instrument that I played because it's self-contained and it can accompany. Um, I really would have loved to have been in more bands as a kid. Um, so I think I started out and started to look for ways of making music that was more than just me, but I didn't really click with other people to play with. Um, in terms of the international work being done, yeah, I've had a lot of support and residencies and influences from people who work in these technologies and 
actually I adapted the harp gestural recognition stuff from the work of violinists and Mari Kimura and Irkam in Paris. So yeah, I mean, it, it does, I'm really lucky to own a computer, to have access to the funding, to the people who have supported me to, to fund the, these motion sensors and things. And it has been a long haul, you know, it's been, I think I've been working in this area for 15 years now. So it doesn't all happen at once. I think all techno technology tends to get more accessible and cheaper as it moves on. Um, there's a lot available at the minute um, in terms of loop stations and pedals and things and ways to um, mm. manipulate sound. But I guess you need to have a computer for a start to do what I'm doing. Um, so there's company, yeah, there's a lot. I, I work a lot in academia as well, and there's a lot to read there and to work with in terms of research that's published, but it it does require some translation, I guess. Um, and I'm lucky to have had a background in science too, so I'm not really put off by, um, I guess, technical language. Um, in terms of access to technology, it is a problem. There's not a lot of women working in sound engineering, for example, and computers and tech can be kind of daunting. And I think if you view it as a, a white page, any kind of creation, the first hump to get over is just relax about the fact that it might be bad or it might not work or it might and get comfortable with improvisation and with risk. And it's OK if it doesn't sound good, try again just to get over that kind of it's okay if you don't understand what it is then you just reach out ask people you know i ask people all the time my work is built on the work of other people um so Una, I think I, I, I thank you for that i see um because of time and i'm i know you have people absolutely you've you're holding them here with your interesting ideas but I don't want to hold you up nor people up either, but just to say Imogen has a question here that she's very interested in how you describe live performance as, I lost it there, and that was another question coming in, as a period of creation. How and what are you creating in lockdown with no audiences? And has it affected your output positively at all? So has lockdown increased your creativity, given you more time and space, or have you missed the audiences, which obviously is something that a lot of artists will empathize with? It's a really long answer. Um, I'll try and keep it short. The, at first, I was completely terrified and very stressed. I mean, there's a really, there was a really tangible financial uh, impact of lockdown, uh, as there were for every artist. So it was terrifying. And then I was able to apply for some of the schemes that were introduced for um, coronavirus support. And once I got one of those, I was then find myself with the initial terror of not being able to afford to live so much. I, I, once that's covered, you then realize, well, I can't go out and I can't fly. And it is true when you're working as an artist, sometimes there's a lot of travel involved and to suddenly not be allowed to leave, not be allowed because approaching creative work to me is not straightforward. You know, there's days that the whole house will be cleaned and a gourmet dinner will be prepared to prevent me having to confront <laughs> a new piece, you know, it's it's awful. Um, but once you're not allowed to go out, you're not allowed to travel, you can't visit your sister. So I guess I have made some things. Um, some of them were influenced by lockdown. The, the improvised music company um, had a series called Piece by Piece. And that is a kind of a good um, narrative of, of my initial periods of lockdown. I'm now working on a lot of uh, composition commissions um, so f funded by Moving On Music and the Arts Council in the North as well. So really grateful for those funds having been made available and really grateful for the time and space. Yeah. So it has its advantages and disadvantages. No doubt about that. Thanks for that question, Imogen. Look, I'm really conscious that, that Una has given us such an interesting overview of her music and what she does. And we're very privileged to have Una join us for Harp Ireland's second lecture. And many thanks to Una. Thank you too to the arts Thank you. Um, who has been enormously supportive of the work that we are doing. And of course, thanks to all of the harpers out there who've continued to play right throughout lockdown and keep 
our national spirits up. Not, not alluding to the second question about you know, political and cultural identity. Without those Harpers, we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't be speaking to you today. So Una, many thanks. Thank you. Not at all. And in the meantime, many, many thanks for joining us. Sonagi Kafoil, August Nolikona.